One, there we go. Good evening. Tonight's presentation is uh, part two of this year's Exaudio lectureship. Some of you got to hear Dr. Jansen uh, yesterday, and uh, it's good to see you back again tonight. Uh, my name is Douglas Miller. If, uh, if you don't know who I am, I'm Emeritus Professor of Biblical and Religious Studies uh, here at Tabor. The Tabor X Audio Lectureship in Vocation and Service is an annual academic lectureship in which a scholar is invited to present on a meaningful expression of Christian discipleship that arises from his or her professional discipline. The purpose of the lectureship is to challenge and encourage believers in their individual and collective calling of work and service for Christ and his kingdom. We're pleased to have, as you know, uh, this year, uh, our new president, Dr. David Jansen, who arrived this last July. Dr. Jansen's academic training is in the discipline of computer science, in which, along with mathematics, he earned his undergraduate degree from Tabor College. He completed his master's and PhD degrees in computer science at the University of Kansas. He has published 38 peer-reviewed journal or conference papers and been awarded over $1 million in research or outreach funding, including three National Science Foundation grants. You might hear a little bit more about that tonight. After working as a software engineer and technical manager at Sprint, he taught computer science and software engineering at Bethel College, Kansas, at California Polytechnic State University, and at Westmont College. Pertinent to tonight's topic as a faculty fellow with Cal Poly's Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship, and as a small business development center consultant, he helped many students and community members found companies in San Luis Obispo, California. In 2012, he co-founded Steadfast Innovation, which created the Squid handwritten note-taking app. Dr. Jansen is a native of Independence, Kansas, and Eden, Oklahoma. His wife, Karen, attended Tabor College before graduating from Fresno Pacific University and obtaining a Master of Music in Choral Conducting from Northern Arizona University. They are the parents of four adult children. Dr. Jansen's presentation this evening is entitled The Paradox of Christian Entrepreneurship. So please welcome Dr. Jansen. Thanks very much, Doug. I appreciate it. And thanks for coming on a cold Thursday night. It's great to be here. I am excited about the topic of the evening. And I, uh, I would invite you, if you have questions or would like to talk about it, stick around. I've got time afterwards. The topic is the paradox of Christian entrepreneurship. And like any good lecture, we start by defining a few terms. And so we'll start with that first term, paradox. What does that mean? Well, this is one option, a pair of docs, a pair of doctors. Uh, but that's not the definition that I would use. I asked, asked at least David for his permission to do that. Sorry, Sarah, I didn't ask you. <laughs> Paradox. So a seemingly absurd or self-contradictory statement or proposition that when investigated or explained may prove to be well-founded or true. So in other words, it's a statement that when you first read it, it's like, oh, that doesn't make any sense. But then when you dig a little deeper, think a little harder, maybe have an experience with it, all of a sudden you're like, oh, that makes perfect sense. Paradoxes can be a lot of fun sometimes. Sometimes they can be frustrating as well. But that idea of something that on the surface maybe doesn't make a lot of sense. So what are some examples? One example I would give is uh, maybe you've heard this statement, in order to make money, you have to spend money. Well, on its surface, like, well, that doesn't make any sense. Um, how am I making money by spending money? But if you just think about it a little bit, um, it's, it's maybe pretty obvious. Most businesses do that. You have to spend a little money, buy a little raw materials or do something and improve them, and then you can sell them for a profit. And so it makes a lot of sense. Here, here is our example. A lot of people will do this. You buy a home. 
This was our home in Morro Bay, and we did a lot of work on it. We spent a lot of money on it. We painted it. I built that fence, my wife and I did, and we put in some artificial grass because grass doesn't grow in California because there's no water. And, um, and then eventually we sold it for a profit. And so we had to spend money in order to make some money. So an example of a paradox. In the Bible, there are also some good examples. And so here's one I really like from Mark 8.35. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and the gospel, for the gospel, will save it. That doesn't make any sense. I have to lose my life to save it or, or save my life. I lose it. I, I, how does that make sense? But if you dig into it and you experience it, and I dare say a lot of people maybe have not experienced it, and it doesn't make sense to the world, but for those who do understand it, it makes perfect sense by giving up everything and saying, God, you're in charge. I give up. I'm going to lose my life and let you lead it. I'm going to gain life. I will gain an abundant life and God will lead me on it. And that's kind of what I was trying to talk about yesterday in the first one of letting God be in charge. Let him be Lord and see where he takes you and what he has for you. And it's amazing what an abundant life that he will, he will lead you to. And to come back to that, I had a student ask me a great question yesterday after that. He said, what if God calls you to just stay put? What if God doesn't call me to go on these great adventures or do all of these interesting things? I thought that was a fantastic question. God may absolutely do that. He may say, your job, what I want you to do, my will for your life is to stay in the same hometown where you grew up and work maybe a certain job and, and spend your life there. And it's not, you're not going to see Paris, you're not going to see, you know, uh, Abu Dhabi. Um, that may be what God calls you to, but I absolutely believe, because I trust God so much, that if he calls you to that, it's going to be so purposeful and missional, and you will find great contentment and great joy in that. If that's what God has called you to, he will lead you through that. And so I encourage you in that way. Um, and so this is a biblical paradox that I think, makes a lot of sense once you actually experience it. I've experienced uh, a paradox in my career since the Ex Audio Lecture is about vocation and, and career is a part of that. What, what are your jobs? What are you going through? When I was at Sprint, I talked about that yesterday, um, and I had this call to go teach in a Christian college, cut my salary more than half. Well, it seemed like a paradox to say you will earn more money and have more opportunities for advancement by leaving your high paying corporate job that has built in promotion opportunities. When I would say that or, or think that, I didn't really think it at the time, but in retrospect, I look back at it, that's actually what happened. But at the time, my peers thought I was crazy. What are you doing leaving this great job? You're good at it, you're making a lot of money, you've got a good uh, future here. Um, why would you go and teach? And it did. It felt like a, I was taking a vow of poverty to, to go and teach in a Christian college rather than be in the corporate world. Uh, and, it, and it felt like this sacrifice. And I was af especially afraid that in computer science that my skills would atrophy. That not being in the corporate world where you're being pushed to use the latest technologies and, and learn new things all the time, that maybe I would lose my edge and not be on top of my skills. What was, what was surprising to me is the opposite happened. Teaching actually allowed me to choose what I wanted to work on. Rather than my boss saying, this is the project you need to do, these are the technologies you need to use, I got to choose those things, and I got to choose what languages I learned and, and what project I worked on, what kind of research things I, I went after, and this is something I hadn't expected. It opened up all these consulting and entrepreneurial opportunities that I hadn't even thought would be coming. Um, and surprise, surprise, after a couple of years, I was making as much or more money than I was in the corporate world because of things that I was doing in the summers, doing consulting and doing some entrepreneurial things. And so it felt like, as I look back on it, a bit of a, of a paradox. It didn't make sense at first, but then it made perfect sense later. And so the question we wanna, I want to wrestle, wrestle with tonight is, what is Christian entrepreneurship, and is that a paradox, something that doesn't make sense on the surface, but when you dig into it, it makes perfect sense. So another definition, what is entrepreneurship? The activity of setting up a business or businesses 
taking on financial risks in the hope of profit. So kind of three things there. You're creating a business, taking on risk, and you're hoping for some kind of a profit. It often involves some sort of innovation or creativity. So the question of, is Christian entrepreneurship a paradox? Well, the first thing, if we think about creating some sustainable nonprofit, like planting a church, for instance, is an entrepreneurial kind of a thing to do. You're starting something, it's a business, but it's a, it's a nonprofit, but it has to have some money or some income in, in order to survive. But it makes perfect sense that that could further Christ's kingdom. That's the whole point, right? Is, is to further Christ's kingdom through this entity, this enterprise that you're doing. So that doesn't seem like a paradox, it makes perfect sense. And that's a great thing to do, by the way, is, is to take entrepreneurial thinking into ministry and how can we further Christ's kingdom here on this earth? But if you think about it with a for-profit business, maybe it does feel more like a paradox. Creating a for-profit business can further Christ's kingdom. On the surface, you might say, it doesn't make any sense. And especially when you look at this verse, maybe you know, Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. When I look at that verse, you think creating a for-profit business and furthering Christ's kingdom, that verse almost says you can't do both. You can't serve money and God at the same time. But maybe you already understand where we're going with that. Perhaps they can come together. Maybe it does make sense. Is there a way? How do we do it? So I want to look at Christian entrepreneurship, well, let's think about what does it mean to be a Christian, to be a follower of Christ, Christ and God. Well, God, is God an entrepreneur? I think it's an interesting question to explore. Let's look at these three things. Is God innovative and creative? Does he take risks? And does he have a hope of a future profit? Well, is God an entrepreneur? Is he innovative and creative? I dare say he's very innovative and creative. He created the universe. He created Earth. He created planets. And not just our solar system. This is a picture taken by Project Kepler. And some of you know Project Kepler, one of the main systems leads on that project is a a Tabor alum, Bryce Unruh, a good friend of ours. And this picture was taken. And what they discovered with Project Kepler, we didn't know before that project, whether there were other solar systems that that had planets that were potentially inhabitable. We didn't know that. We kind of guessed maybe that'd be kind of cool. And, and maybe if you've read the book Out of the Silent Planet um, and you've, you've thought about that, what if there was another world where there were beings created by God and, and what would that have been like? Well, with Project Kepler, we discovered that there are thousands of other solar systems that have planets in them that are in that Goldilocks zone of 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 not too close to their sun, but but not too far away, that maybe are potentially inhabitable. Uh, And this is a picture of that. I mean, what an amazing God that was so creative to build something so big and broad and amazing. And then even on our earth, if you go and you just look at some of the beauty of creation, you think how creative and, and interesting this earth is. And, and I meant to get some pictures of like a gecko and uh, you know, a duck-billed platypus and, and some strange birds. You know, God just has this, this amazing creativity. And so I think we can check that box that, yes, God is innovative and, and creative. So what about the second one, risk? I think God took a huge risk on the human race when he gave us free will. God created us. And then he said, rather than creating us and saying, you're all going to love me, you're going to follow me, you're going to have no choice but to praise me and glorify me and worship me. Instead, he said, I'm going to let you decide. And I'm going to put the future of the world in your hands. I'm going to let you be my hands and feet and, and to be... Uh, have the opportunity to choose whether you follow me. That was a big risk on his part. It could be that we all just rejected him and said, no, we're not interested in it. Um, But I think that's a major risk that he took. What was the hope of the future prophet in that risk? Well, I think that it's us. We are the reward 
for which God took that huge risk of free will, in my, in my opinion. Our obedience, our love, our praise for God, our participation in bringing his kingdom on this earth, that's the reward that God has and he sees in taking that risk of letting us decide whether we love him or not, whether we will follow him or not. And then eternity in his presence, I think, is part of that reward. And so I think in my, my book, in my little evaluation there, I think, yes, God is an entrepreneur. He satisfies all three of those things. So what about us? We are made in God's image, the Bible says. And so do we have innate in us an entrepreneurial spirit? I think perhaps we do. I think he has given us inside of all of us, maybe to a different degree, but there is some entrepreneurial spirit that we have. I think we all have some innate desire to innovate and create. You might say, well, I'm not very creative, but just doing something, building something, writing a paper, doing a craft as an elementary school kid was, was a creative process. Perhaps it's in woodworking. Maybe it's, it's with metal. Maybe it's art. Maybe it's music. Uh, but we all have some desire to accomplish something and, and to build something, to make something, and we have satisfaction in that accomplishing something. We have a capacity to take calculated risks. It requires faith and trust, um, but all of us, we take risks all the time. We go out in the cold, we drive a car, you say hi to someone and hope that they'll say hello back. We take risks all the time, and, and so that's a normal thing that we're built to do. Notice I have the note here from Matthew 25, the, the parable of the talents, where God gave different measures of talents to, to these individuals. One talent, five talent, ten talents. And there was an expectation you were going to do something with that. But the, the one who had the one talent who didn't take any risk, I was afraid. I knew you were a shrewd master, and so I just hid it and did nothing with it. And that was reprimanded. That was not what God wanted them to do. They wanted them to take a risk as the ones with the five and the ten talents did. And so I think it's normal for us to take a risk. We have, uh, it takes some faith, and some of us have to be pushed a little bit to take those risks, but we have that in us. And then finally, we all have, I think, a hope for a future profit. So we're willing to do something, work hard to attain some future goal. For you students, you're here, you're willing to go to class, you're willing to learn things and pay money for that hope of getting that degree and getting a job and being prepared for the world. And so I think that's normal and that's it's healthy and it's good. And so I think we all have that entrepreneurial spirit in us. But what does it mean to be a Christian entrepreneur or what is Christian entrepreneurship is what we're gonna wrestle with here. Traditional entrepreneurship has a primary goal of making money, okay? But Christian entrepreneurship takes that same traditional entrepreneurship and adds to it a primary goal of furthering God's kingdom, is what I would propose. And it could take many forms. I've got several of them here. Could be an opportunity to make disciples within the business that you create. So I'm gonna start an enterprise, I'm gonna start a business, and one of the opportunities that I have is I get to set the culture of that business. I get to hire people and I get to share the gospel with them. I get to run it with Christian standards and values. And so that's an opportunity that I have. Another one is to make disciples, to share the gospel and make disciples through the customers and the partners that you work with. Other opportunities is maybe your point is just to earn money so that you can give that money to ministries that you believe in that will further Christ's kingdom. That could be Christian entrepreneurship. And I've met people who do that specifically. It could be that it opens doors to un unreached countries and people groups. It's harder and harder to go to many countries as a professional or full-time missionary these days. There's many countries where the only way you can get in is maybe as a teacher or as an entrepreneur doing business development, doing economic development. And so doing that could give you an opportunity to get into places where you can share the gospel that otherwise you maybe couldn't. And then finally here, another example, is serving people through the products and services that you create in your, in your company and whatever it is. It is a service. Whether, you know, imagine just you're creating a restaurant is your, is your enterprise, that's your entrepreneurial activity, and you're serving people, you're meeting a need, you're providing food for them, and that is a ministry. It can be viewed as a ministry. 
So I want to talk, I, I love to tell stories. You saw that yesterday, and so I'm going to tell some more stories as, as we think about that. And we're going to uh, come back around and, and wrestle with this Christian entrepreneurship and, and and how is it not a paradox? So for me, my entrepreneurial journey, I, I, I don't know that I'm a serial entrepreneur, but I do have a bit of that spirit in me, which I think we all have a little bit. It started as a kid, and maybe many of you did this as well. I was maybe 10, 11 years old when I started mowing lawns, and that was my first business. I would go to the neighbors, and uh, my parents let me borrow the lawnmower, and as long as I mowed our lawn, I could use the lawnmower on anybody else's lawn. I didn't get paid to mow our lawn, but I, I could do it for others. My first real job outside of the house was working for my grandfather at his grain elevator, and that started to expose me to what it's like to run a business. So I wasn't being an entrepreneur. I was just getting a job, but I was starting to see what a small business was like and, and how that operated and how you get into it, how you get started. When I moved to Enid, Oklahoma, I really wanted to, I was 16 years old and I was into cars. I thought cars were pretty cool and I really wanted to work at the Napa Parts Store. There was a guy in our church at the Enid MB Church, his name was Joe Fleming and he had the Napa Parts Store in Enid, Oklahoma and I wanted to work there and he said, nah, it's gonna take too long to teach you by the time you learn the job, you're gonna graduate and go off to college and you're gonna be no good to me. But his wife, Arlene Fleming, had the Baskin Robbins ice cream store in town. And so I was smart, and I went and I got a job there. And I thought, if I prove myself there, maybe I'll get my foot in the door. And sure enough, I did. Eventually, I said, hey, can I just come sweep the floor or something over at the parts? Or, oh, okay, you can come sweep the floor. And eventually, I started learning the parts, and he let me, let me uh, work at the parts store. But these were great mentors for me in seeing what is it like to run a, start and run a small business. And it was good exposure for me. And because I was working at the parts store and my father was working at Janssen Oldsmobile and GMC there in Enid, um, I had the opportunity, whenever he would get an old car traded in that he didn't want to keep, he didn't want to sell on the lot, they would wholesale it, meaning they would sell it to some other dealer um, and, or try and find someone to buy it without putting it on their lot. And he would call around and he, and he eventually started including me and say, well, David, I've got this car, uh, I'd like $800 for it an old car, it's not very, you know, good, whatever, would you buy it? And I'd come and I'd look at it and say, is that stuff that I can fix on it? Can I, um, can I make it better and make a profit on it? And so I started doing that as a 17-year-old, and I could get parts at a discount from the Napa store where I was working as well. So I started flipping cars like they flip houses, and I think by the time I graduated from Tabor, I had bought and sold like 11 cars. Didn't make money on all of them, but I made money on enough of them to make it worthwhile. My favorite was when I bought a car for a little Mazda GLC for $600. And you remember I talked about, yesterday I talked about going out to New Hampshire to teach water skiing at this camp. Well, I drove that $600 car. I had to fix a few things, a heater and a couple of other things. I drove it 40-some hours from Oklahoma to New Hampshire, spent my summer out there, drove it back, and I sold it for $1,200. I thought that was a pretty good deal. And then I put on here at last my father, Roger Jansen, who uh, never, I think, thought of himself as an entrepreneur, but he did. He started a number of businesses, and including a farm, and, and it was just a great inspiration for me to see the risk-taking that was involved uh, and started thinking about entrepreneurship. When I went into industry, I started working at Sprint, and I loved the creative aspect of it. What can we do? We were, we were doing telecommunications fraud detection. So maybe you can imagine if you have a credit card, have you ever had your credit card stolen or the number stolen? Maybe physically it wasn't stolen. Um, maybe you used it at a, at a restaurant or something and all of a sudden somebody bought something off of Amazon with your card. Um, how could that be? Well, that's fraud that's going on. We had that with calling cards back most of you don't know about this, but back before we had cell phones, we had calling cards, and, and when you would travel, you would have to use a calling card, and people would steal them. They might just be standing at a payphone next to you and, and watch you punch in the numbers, and then they, they, they would go and sell the credit card, the calling card number that you had, and it was a huge black market for this. At Sprint, we were losing about a million dollars a day to calling card fraud, and so I was a part of a group that uh, it called, called Advanced Systems Engineering, and our job was to build a system, an expert system, that would try and detect patterns 
that were fraudulent and determine what's a fraudulent call and what's a legitimate call. And we've got that million dollars a day down to about $150,000 lost a day. And so we were just heroes in the company. Uh, that was pretty fantastic. And, and one of the things that I worked on that I was very involved in ended up uh, getting a patent. And so it was a bit of innovation and creativity. And so I'm showing off my patent there um, as an example. When I was at Bethel College, I tried doing a number of things. One of them was I had an inner term that was free that I wasn't teaching. And I was trying to, uh, and the web was just pretty new. And so I built, I wanted to build a web application just to learn the technology. And so I started something called Carlot Pro. This was before we had cars.com or autotrader.net or anything like that. And it was ability for use car lots to take a picture and upload a picture and the information about the vehicles they had for sale and, and show it on the web. They didn't, really, they didn't have that ability before this, and so I was building an application to do that. And so I went around, and I was driving around Hutchinson, all these car lots in Wichita, and, and showing them what I had done, and, seeing, and I had several of them sign up, and they were going to pay me this much a month to do it. And then all of a sudden... February came around and my classes started and, and you know, I'm scratching my head. It's like, well, what am I going to be, a professor or am I going to be an entrepreneur? I've got to choose. I realize this is just too much time. And so I decided I'm going to be a professor. I believe God has called me to do that and I need to continue that. And so I let Carlotte Pro go. I did start a little company I called Cymex. I took my two sons' names. We only had the two boys at the time. Simon and Alex put it together and, and we called it Cymex. And, and I did consulting and training and, um, and so that was one of the things I, I continued to do even up until last year. My wife and I bought the little house next door and we turned it into a little bed and breakfast. This was before Airbnb was a thing. And so we had the campus cottage in North Newton. And so those were some examples of some early small entrepreneurial ventures that I, I did. Some of them, you know, did well, some not so well. And that's normal when we do entrepreneurship. Go fast forward then a few years to I finished my PhD and I went back to Cal Poly and or went to Cal Poly and started teaching there. And in 2008, the iPhone came out. And then a year later, Android came out and Google had bought Android. And, and so I thought, I think we ought to teach the first Android class. Nobody, no universities or colleges were teaching Android yet. And so um, I, we had a connection at Google. I contacted them. They were able to, to get our foot in the door, get a little grant with some money to hire a TA to help me build this class. And they sent me 24 of the original G1 Android phones. They're really hard to get. Um, they had just come out, but they said, we'll let you have these. Uh, actually, what they said is, if you don't make us fill out any paperwork, you can come and get the box. <laughs> Drive up to Mountain View, get the box, and, and they're yours. And they were, they were intended to go to some place in Europe, and so they had European plugs, and so we had to adapt them for the U.S., and, and it was kind of crazy. But we had phones, and so I advertised to the students, we're going to teach the first Android class, and I had 35 students. It was the maximum capacity in the classroom. And I told them, Android is brand new. There are only maybe 20 or 30,000 apps in the App Store at the time. It might be a fad, and it might be gone in a year. But if it takes off, you're in early. So now's a great opportunity to do something entrepreneurial or humanitarian. I had one team did something, do something humanitarian, and everybody else did something entrepreneurial. And out of that first, company, first class, we had six companies start. And as of a, I checked a few years ago, and all six of those either still existed or had been acquired. And I'll tell stories of a couple of them. And so here's one of them. In that class, I had two young men that, that said um, their idea was they were going to create a bus tracker. So in San Luis Obispo, we had city buses that would go around. They had their routes that they would go around. They'd come to Cal Poly, the university there, and they'd go downtown. And, and it was a, a hassle to know where are these buses. Are they on time? Are they, are they early? Uh, it's no fun to miss the bus. So they used the GPS, um, uh, well, they used a variety of different technologies, and they built an app. And you can see the app here. And in fact, this is a screenshot I just took yesterday from their website. The app looks almost exactly like it did back in 2010 in my class. They built this app in that class, and it w I'll never forget the day they came to me and said they'd been building this app, and they, 
we're trying to figure out how do I get the data? There's a transponder on all of the buses that's, that's sending data. Uh, it's using GPS to know where it is, and it's sending data back to somewhere, um, indicating where it is, um, what, what are its GPS locations. And they had hacked in, they'd found the feed, and they'd hacked into it, and, and without anyone's permission, they'd gotten the feed of data, and they were so excited. Look at this. We can see the bus moving around. You know, we know where the buses are. And I was like, oh, guys, you're in trouble. <laughs> you can't hack into there. You've got to get permission to do that. And so I helped him get a conversation with the city and with the vendor who was providing it, and immediately the, the vendor shut him down and said, no, you can't have that access, and, and uh, we're going to sue you and all of this. But we had you know, we had the conversation, but but what if we offered this as a service? What if um, we gave it to you for free? You know, whatever. We had this whole conversation, and eventually the city came along and said, "Oh yeah, that is actually a really nice idea." Well, now they do it for all sorts of companies, all sorts of, of um, cities, municipalities. Their first client was Apple who came to them and said, oh, I like what you did. We have buses that move around our different sites in, in Silicon Valley going from one building to another building. Would you, could we license your app um, for us? And they were like, oh, let's make a company out of it. And so Bishop Peak Technology started out of that class. And today, well, okay, last time I checked a couple of years ago, there were about 50 or 60 employees. How cool is that? A class project that, that is still going today with 50 or 60 employees in it. This is my favorite story to tell from that class. So uh, one day in class, I, I, uh, I used something that I'd learned from another professor, and I pulled my wallet out and said, said, atoms to bits, what are things that we have that are physical that we can turn into digital things? That's a great way to think of an app. And so what's in my wallet? And I pulled out you know, some credit cards and business cards, and, and, and I pulled out a... a a punch card. It was like a buy 10, get one free sandwich card that we had at Smokehouse, these great tacos in, in Cayucas. And I said, can you turn this into an app? And these two guys, uh, Reed Morse and, and Grantland Chu, said, let's do that. And they built an app called Punched. And so they created a digital version of it. And so you would go to a store, and they would show a QR code. You'd scan it. It would use GPS to make sure you were really there so you're not cheating. And you would get your punch. Um, on, your, on your phone. You didn't have to keep track of your punch card or lose them, whatever. And so they were going around town and trying to get lots of other people to uh, sign up, and they had coffee shops and different groups that were doing that. And, uh, and then they continued and built the iPhone version of it in the senior project with me. And about six months after they graduated, so about a little over a year after they first built this app in the class, Google approached them. Because Marissa Mayer, uh, who had been the VP of, of I forget what, at, at Google, she was one of the two people who created Gmail, and she later went on to be CEO of Yahoo. Well, she came down to, to Cal Poly to speak, and I was asked to host her for lunch and then to take her to a, a class and show off some of the apps that our students were creating. And that day, she met Reed Morse, and he showed her Punched, and I said, you really ought to talk to, to Reed. And so... Six months later, after they had graduated, Google acquired them for a reported $10 million. So can you imagine six months after graduating from your undergraduate getting bought by Google? Now, nobody says officially what the number was, but that's what the rumor was. And, and Reed, in particular, is still working for Google. Google. He works for Waymo for the uh, uh, automated driving um, uh, side of things. Well, you can imagine, after that happened, I had hundreds of students at my door saying, do that for me. <laughs> I'm like, I can't guarantee that. I didn't do that. They did all the work. And, and they just happened to be in the right place at the right time. And they worked really hard. They were very ambitious. Um, but it just created this stream of entrepreneurship of, wow, if they can do that, what can I do? Just like yesterday I was saying, testimony invokes wonder. When you see what happened in someone else's life, you wonder what might happen in my life. If that could happen to them, what could happen to me? So it's just a great story of, of Punched. Here's a variety of other, other companies that I've worked with in the, in the last several years. Most of these are students. And uh, NeoCharge is this little device that for electric cars, let's say that you've got a 220 outlet in your house for your dryer, and you'd like to use that for charging your electric car. Well, 
it's no fun to go and unplug it every time the dryer. And so this is just a splitter that allows you to charge your car and run the dryer at the same time. In California, they have laundry in the garage more, and so that's a more common thing. It's too cold in, in Kansas to do that. But, um, so that was NeoCharge, and then a whole app around that for controlling that and watching how much electric usage do we have. And then Flume, down in the bottom right corner, was a similar kind of a thing. They developed this device that you strap onto the water pipe out at the meter, and it sends a signal into your house onto the Wi-Fi, and then you've got an app, and you can monitor how much um, uh, water usage you have. And in particular, it's really good to detect leaks if you have a leak in your house or while you're away. Um, so that was a great example. Poly Pi. This is a great example of a non-traditional student who came to Cal Poly to do an MBA and had some entrepreneurial ideas, but then struggled with finding a computer scientist to implement them. Students were all working on their own projects, professionals were too expensive, and so she decided, well, I guess I'll just get a master's in computer science while I'm at it. And she did, and as she was doing that, she took an AI class and, um, uh, on uh, natural language processing, and she got really interested in that, and she ended up changing her ideas in entrepreneurship, and she built this application that you can ask questions of about devices, and, and you put these little PolyPy notices or, or QR codes all around campus, for instance, whenever maintenance might use it, whenever something is broken, you can report, oh, this is not working, or this needs to be fixed, or this needs to be cleaned, or whatever, and it would have a dialogue with you. Well, what exactly is wrong with it? Can you tell me more about this? And, and it would automatically do all of that. And so on. A couple of other examples there. Harvestly.com or, or .co is a company that I worked with a little bit in, in trying to make it easy for producers um, who are, you know, whether you're making microgreens or growing um, lemons in your yard or whatever it may be, and getting them connected to consumers without going through a grocery store and, and trying to make that a little simpler, especially for organic foods. And then Memrus was uh, these two, uh, a couple, a man and a wife, who um, had worked in industry and they decided they had an idea of a better way for interacting with, with your phone, with Android. Rather than keyboards and typing, can we do some things with very fine motor skills with our fingers? And they had this really novel idea, and so they've been working for a couple years on that, and I worked closely with them. And that's one that's, that uh, they've advertised a little bit, but it hasn't gone public yet. And so these were just some examples of some of the kinds of things that, that I got to participate in. I didn't do all of this. It was just I got to be a part of their story and, and giving advice and watching what they were doing. Those were all in my area in software, but we saw a lot of entrepreneurship at Cal Poly with students around other areas, and I got connected with various different ways. Impress Technologies was one of the biggest success stories that we had there, and it was a biomedical engineering uh, student who created this device that would help stop bleeding um, when there was some po when when a woman would give birth in some rare si situations it would happen that there would be some hemorrhaging and some bleeding and and this very simple device that they de designed uh, could be used to to save a life in in that situation and especially what was great about it is it could be sent all around the world uh, where there's not great medical care. And so a lot of this going into some third world countries. And it was a relatively simple uh, device, um, but in order to get a medical device approved is a long process. You have to go through all this FDA approval and everything. And so this student said, I think there's a lot of promise here, but I don't want to work that hard. <laughs> not, not that they were lazy, but they wanted to go, they, they didn't want to see it through. They wanted to go on to something else. What was interesting is they found two other people who said, I don't know how to, didn't know how to create that device, but I want to go and turn that into a product, and I think it's good for the world, and I think it'll make a lot of money. And so I got connected with one of them, and we were actually doing a Bible study weekly um, with, with one of those co-founders. Eventually, in fact, just this last year, that company got acquired by another company, which just had a, uh, got acquired another time for $240 million dollars. Imagine that. Now, that was about an eight-year process, getting through all of the approvals and stuff. Um, but I thought it was pretty impressive, and that coming from the, the biomedical side. Another one, this one I didn't work with at all, but I observed it. Uh, a young lady said, I'm tired of um, uh, wearing my, I, I want to be able to 
not have two different pairs of shoes when I go to work or to a fancy event. I want to be able to wear heels when I'm there, but I don't want to have to wear heels walking down the street to get there. And so she came up with this idea and got a, a, a mechanical engineer to work with her. And they came up with this idea of a convertible shoe where you can take the heel off. And it's, it's kind of clever, and, and they had to do lots of different prototypes, but um, it's, it actually works pretty well. And, and this one was on Shark Tank, which was kind of fun, and they've done really well. Uh, the last one that I'll show from, from these students, um, a young man whose, parent, whose dad was in construction, and he was always the guy who had to get up in the truck and get the, get the tools out, and he was always hitting his head on the roof, and, and it was hard to get at stuff. And so he, came, he was working on a design, a company called Armadillo Designs, custom shell designs for pickup trucks. You can see how the top opens up and you can get in and stand up and get at stuff a little easier and then, and then cover that up. And so the point being, there's just all sorts of different areas that you can innovate and, and do entrepreneurship. Shift gears just a little bit. I mentioned, I showed a picture of some of them yesterday. One of the best examples I've seen of business as mission was when Karen and I, well, the story is we were in London. Karen was in the Google booth, so Google would invite us. Uh, I'm going to tell you about my company that I started here in just a little bit. We have an app called Squid. It's a handwriting app. And Google would invite us to be in their booth at this huge education conference, BET, in London in January. January is a terrible time to go to London but because um, uh, it's cold like it is here right now. But uh, And she was... There were like 60,000 people at this conference, and the Google booth was just packed, but Karen, just, uh, my wife, just did a fantastic job of showing off Squid, and this older couple from Thailand came up to her and was asking about Squid, and, and they said, oh, we have a, uh, a Christian school in Thailand, and Karen <laughs> said to them, oh, I'm a Christian, and they said, I know. And if you know Karen, you probably understand that. It's like she just, she just has the love of Christ just flowing out of her. And, and so they recognized it. And, and in, in 10 minutes, they be just became best friends. And they invited us to come to see their school. And believe it or not, we did. And so this is their school in Thailand. And they started it some 50 years ago as a Christian school for Buddhist students. And, and you might be like, what Buddhist kids in Thailand are going to go to this Christian school? Well, what they do is they bring North American teachers over, often people who have just graduated from a Christian college, and they come over and they pay them. They pay for their flight, and they, they give them a salary, a stipend, and they give them a place to live and pay their health insurance, and they're teachers for a year or more. Some of them have been there 10, 15 years. And because the teachers are all from North America, they speak Hollywood English. At least that's what the Thai people refer to it as, Hollywood English. And they want their students to learn to speak Hollywood English. And so even though they're Buddhist, they're willing to send their kids to a Christian school because they speak Hollywood English. And so it's this great ministry. Many of these Kids are coming to know Christ through that ministry, and it's a for-profit business, but what a great example of Christian entrepreneurship in my, is in my mind. Okay, so I told you I'd tell you just a little bit about the company that we created. So 10 years ago, in 2012, I was working with um, um, a couple of students, and one of them, uh, both of them had taken my Android class, and we were working, doing consulting for another professor who had an idea for an app, and we were building an app for him. And after we would do our consulting, we would work on our own project, and one of them, Andrew Hughes, uh, who became my co-founder, he started working on this app called Squid, a handwriting note-taking app. He had always been frustrated with all the notebooks that he had to carry around in school. Can't I just have a computer that I can handwrite all my notes, especially in engineering? I'm doing a lot of math things, drawing pictures and, and stuff. And so we tried using a Microsoft uh, laptop, but it was big and chunky. And then, But Android came out, and they were starting to come out with tablets. And the first one, the HTC Jetstream, had a pen with it. And so he said, hey, there's the... Finally, the hardware is there, and so he started building this app. Started with the papyrus, and I was helping him like I was helping a lot of students. And eventually, he launched the app into the App Store, and the very next day, he got a call from Samsung. And, and he called me immediately and said, 
I can't even understand their accent. It's these people from South Korea that called me, and I, I don't, they were saying something about a contract. I need help. I'm desperate. I, I, don't, I need more than just advice. I need a partner. I need somebody I can trust. Andrew is a Christian. He said, I need a Christian brother who can, who's more mature and can lead me through this and who understands the technology. I told him no like six times until finally he convinced me, okay, I'll join you on a part-time basis and, and do that. And so 10 years later, we're still doing it. I've dropped back because I'm now a president of Tabor College. I've dropped back to just a silent partner. I meet with them once a quarter for a few hours just to check in on what's going on. But what fun it has been. The app is, this is a view of what the app is. Um, you can create different kinds of notes. You can open, import PDFs. There's lots of different backgrounds you can have. Here's an example of a student's homework, uh, just notes in a study page for a math, uh, a math exam that they were taking. And it's great. We have people send us artwork that they've created in the app. We even had uh, someone send us a book that they created completely in Squid and then had it, had it published, uh, which was kind of shocking to us. And we never intended it to be used like that. And so that's the company that, that we started and have been doing. And I just share that as an example of the kinds of things that you can do. And, and we use it to think about Christian entrepreneurship. So as we come back after hearing some of those stories, what does it mean to, be, to do Christian entrepreneurship and is it a paradox? Well, I would say it depends on your heart. What is the intent that you have? If your intent is to get rich and be comfortable, it's not Christian entrepreneurship. It's entrepreneurship. Maybe you're a Christian who is in entrepreneurship, um, but your goal is money. Uh, and, uh, but if your intent instead is to serve God, I believe you can genuinely do Christian entrepreneurship. But you have to be very careful. Matthew 19, 24, again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. It's very tempting in entrepreneurship to be focused on making a profit because you have to, and you have to, the company has to succeed. It has to be sustainable. You've got to make money. And by spending so much time thinking about money and making money and how are our revenue is going to, to outpace our, our expenses, are we going to be sustainable? You think about money so much, you can get fixated that, on that and forget what's the whole focus. If you started doing this for Christ and his kingdom, it takes discipline to keep that as the focus. And so it makes it somewhat challenging. Well, as we wrap up, I want to ask what might it look like to do Christian entrepreneurship at Tabor. I would love to see us establish something. Maybe it would be a center that provides resources to enable students and people in our community to start businesses that are specifically for Christ and his kingdom. Possible resources that we might provide in that center through Tabor College, education, classes and workshops, Things about ideation, how do you come up with ideas, how do you come up with a business plan, how do you market it, what's intellectual property, uh, different kinds of, of company formation, education on all those types of things. And we do some of that already. I think we can do even more. Mentoring, providing advice. It's really good to have somebody who's walked through this road before with you, somebody who's started a company themselves, somebody who's been in business, who can give you some advice as you're refining your ideas, as you're trying to pitch your ideas to others, to refine that pitch and to make it, make it good, and as you're implementing those ideas. Access, having access to people who want to invest in your company or partners who might work with you and help you. Access to customers, access to the equipment or the tools or, that you might need in order to build prototypes or, or to pilot it. Um, space where you might have your office or, or be building things. In particular, a space, a place to build things, so maybe a shop uh, with various kind of equipment in it. A place to explore, to create, to collaborate, to plan, to market, to sell. Um, might we even have on campus pop-up businesses where you can try your business out and, and you can sell boba drinks or you can sell those t-shirts or neck pillows or whatever it may be. Uh, I think we could do those kinds of things here. And inspiration, I think that's one of the things that we can do well. Actually, we have a lot of entrepreneurs 
in our alumni network. We have a lot of people who have graduated from Tabor and have gone on to do some really fantastic things in entrepreneurship. And I look forward to sharing more of those stories. Some of them are going to be coming out here pretty soon. We're going to be bringing some of those people to campus. But we also have people right here among us, some of our faculty and staff, and, and even students who are entrepreneurs. And we just need to do a great job of telling those stories. And, and, uh, and I think it's very inspirational when we see that. And then opportunity, providing uh, time and the space to do it and attention and events that just focus on these entrepreneurial things is part of what I think it might look like. So if we were successful, what might it look like at Tabor? I think success would be students and community members that are starting successful businesses here on campus in Hillsboro and the area, Marion County throughout the United States and perhaps even around the world. Uh, but I think that's where we would see it, is that, s that businesses would actually be started. And in particular, businesses that are for Christ and his kingdom. And we see a very clear connection of how that's happening. In addition to starting businesses, going through entrepreneurial training and thinking in these ways, I think is good for everyone. Anyone who's hired someone else loves it when they come in and they bring ideas, they bring a, an understanding of we're a, we have to make money to stay in business, to, to keep providing jobs. How do we do that? If people understand that, and they're not just doing the job they're told to do, but they actually understand the big picture, and they think creatively, and they come with innovations, most all employers want that kind of a spirit. So even if you're not going to be the risk taker to start your own company, employers will value that in you. We could go on here. I'll just quickly mention, you know, these are just some of the areas that we can be in. I'll actually skip this for the most part here, but I think there's all sorts of different kinds of businesses. You might look at what my stories are. My area is computer science and software, and, and so uh, that's just one niche area. There's so many different types of, of businesses that we can be in, and my encouragement would be that entrepreneurship is not just for business majors. Entrepreneurship is for everyone. I would love to see here at Tabor that we have people involved in entrepreneurship that are from all different majors, from biology, from music, from history, from health and human performance. There are businesses to be created in all of those areas. And in fact, I think that entrepreneurship is best as an undergraduate education component combined with something else. I would encourage people not to just be an entrepreneurship major but to do a minor in entrepreneurship and combine that with some other major, some technical area or area even from the arts. And I think that's the best combination would be my encouragement. Some of you know, because I've come and sat by you in the dining hall and asked you questions, and, and one of my favorite questions to ask is, so if you were to start a business, what would it be? And what's been amazing to me is almost everyone has had an answer to that question without having to think very hard. And, and maybe if you thought harder, you'd come up with even more interesting creative ideas. Well, here's, here's just a, a variety of different things that I've already heard here on campus from you, from many Tabor College students. And, and you can just go through the list. And, and the first one I mentioned already, we have in our bookstore, coming out of the entrepreneurship minor, there is there are some Tabor College branded neck pillows. And so congratulations. I see Ethan and JP over there. Yeah, great job. Great job. And so that's just a great example of, of creating a pilot and getting something started. And that's just the first step, isn't it? You know, then building a business around that. And what might that look like? What will t it take to accomplish some of these things at Tabor? Um, I, it's already going, but I'd like to see it multiplied times 10 or times 100 even. So we have an entrepreneurship minor. Um, I'd like to see that packed with students from all different majors taking that. We're currently exploring adding a graduate program, and so that may come as well, and, and that's a good possibility, and that's been really fun working especially with Melinda Rangel as we think about and dream about what might that look like from a curriculum perspective. I already mentioned we need to tell more of our great alumni stories that are already out there. We just need to tell them. Um, we do need funding for making some of these happen, things happen, uh, funding a director, funding the workshops that we might do, and, and then mentors. Some of that can be volunteer, but some of it will require some money. Uh, partnerships. We've been exploring a variety of different partners that we can work with, and you can see some of those there. 
we need the campus to say, yes, this makes sense. Let's do this and let's go all in on it um, across many majors and activities. Fundings for facilities. I imagine a day where we have a new business building. It's not just our small little business building. And that business building might have an incubator and an accelerator, a space where businesses are being started. And it could even be as broad as where it, maybe it has a little commercial kitchen in it. And so you can test out your idea of starting a restaurant. Maybe it, uh, it has, maybe there or somewhere else, we have some spaces for, for in a shop where you're building things with wood and with metal, you're welding, you're doing using CNC machines and, and so on. Um, those are things down the road. But we can start today with what we have. We don't have to wait for all of that to be in place. But that's a part of the dream of where we might go. Other things we need, advocates, people who love the vision and want to help. And then finally, as we see successes, we can tell those stories and that will just demonstrate that it's working and that it's successful. So I end with this. Will you join us? And, and so that is for you in the room and, and those who would watch online. If, if this is something you would be excited about and you want to be a part of, I invite you to send me an email, get connected and be a part of the conversation. And let's see where it goes. I'm in, in particular excited that it's not just entrepreneurship for entrepreneurship's sake, but entrepreneurship for Christ and his kingdom. Thanks for your attention.